encourage you to partner with Hope and Passion Ministries. This is my full-time work. I'm not only preparing a message every Sunday morning and a Bible study every Tuesday night. I'm out there on TikTok reaching millions of teenagers. So I want to tell you something. Uh, I shared this with Bria earlier. Do you know what another common comment is that I get from Christians who watch TikTok? Young people who say to me, Preacher Shelley, I can't wait to meet you in heaven someday. What about that? You know? And I thought to myself, when I got that comment, I thought to myself, and you will meet in heaven one day so many of the people who are watching me right now, those of you who pray and those of you who give sacrificially to make this happen, you will meet them too. And they will be able to give you thanks. So when you partner with Hope and Passion, your dollars are going into eternity. I promise you that. They're going straight into eternity. We have a reach. It's like we're on the internet and it kind of narrows down like a funnel. And then out the other side of that funnel, there's millions and millions of people. Praise God. So hopeandpassion.org is a place where you can get on and give online, become a monthly partner. And here is our uh, mailing address. Pray about that and ask God what he would have you to do. Okay, here we are divine protection from wrong choices and thank you for all your thumbs up and your likes on that because i'll tell you what it's the reason i live it's the reason i live to put out the gospel and i know that god hasn't called everyone to be able to get on TikTok and produce videos god hasn't called everyone to teach his word but how i value those of you that god has called to pray and support those of us who do those things praise god for it Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 13, and uh, Susan and Larry, you'll be happy to hear that when Bria asked me what verse we're on tonight, and I said to her, 13, 9, it hit me that last week we covered one verse, one verse last week, right? How fun is that? Okay, so yeah, Larry, uh, maybe we'll get one or two in, I don't know, but I thank God for the way he's moving, and I know that you guys appreciate that. So here we go, Genesis 13. I am going to pick it up at verse 8. Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. We're kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord against the Lord the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever hallelujah boy there's a lot of promise tucked into this a lot of direction tucked into this but I want you to know that we do not teach the Bible as if it were a guidebook or an, a set of instructions. Amen? We teach the Bible knowing that it is the living word of God. Knowing that this word, when it is preached, never returns without doing something in the human soul. It will enable you to draw closer to Jesus or you will become hardened if you reject it. But something absolutely miraculous happens every time the word is preached. So we're going to ask God, as we always do, we're going to bow our heart to him. And we're going to ask you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm asking you, Lord, to do things that I can't comprehend. I'm asking you to do things in the hearts of people watching and, and I don't even know what they need. But you do. 
Lord, I believe that this word that I'm holding in my hands is alive according to the scriptures. I believe that this book has been God-breathed. And I am praying and asking you to work mightily in every person watching. Lord, I'm asking you to change lives. I'm asking you to save souls. And I just want to thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. And I pray that you cause everyone who watches to lift up their heart and their eyes to have highest expectations of what happens when we dig into your word. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I was, as I was praying that, I realized I didn't write out this testimony, but recently we have really received a number of incredible and detailed testimonies. And it has been a joy to receive. And one thing that I want to say to you is, I don't have any way to know what all your needs are, but the Holy Spirit does. And because I depend on him and you depend on him in your listening, he's changing lives. I mean, just recently we've got more than just a few, we get testimonies from wives who tell us that their husbands now read the Bible and pray with them, and they never used to before. That is incredible. Men who are turning to God because they're studying the word now with their wives. How beautiful is that? And then we, we receive a testimony, you know, this week there was a long testimony of a woman who said, I went to church my whole life. I went through all the rituals. I did the thing. You know, my church, we would pray, but I never had a relationship with Jesus. The church would read the scriptures, but it was never alive. I never understood the gospel. I was never saved, but I did what I thought I was supposed to do. And she said, here's the deal. She said, I thank God that God used the pandemic. She said, I actually am thankful that for a while the church closed down so that I could get kicked out of my routine. See, that's the problem. Churches are, God, churches are good and God wants us to attend church, but here's the thing. Churches are not good if you're just going there and it's making you feel safe when you're not safe. So she said, I thank God when everything shut down, I depended on Hope and Passion Ministries. I began to really study the Bible with you, Shelley. And she said, here's what happened. My whole life changed. I can't name the exact day, but I know that God saved me and he continued working on me. And now when I read the Bible, I don't just read it. It comes alive to me and my whole life has changed. So praise God for that. I could never know that as I'm teaching, but God knows what he's doing. Amen. So, so much is happening because of our dependence on the Holy Spirit. And because we slow it down and we teach verse by verse verse. Hallelujah. Let the Holy Spirit move. Let God show you what to do. I hope, I know that um, last week, I know I gave an assignment. I said, here's some verses you should underline in your Bible. Here's some things you should focus on. I pray that you do that. I pray that you make some of those your memory verses. You stick them up in places in your house. Count on God's word. So here we are in Genesis 13, 9. What has happened is Abraham and Lot are coming out of the land of Egypt. They both have a whole lot of stuff. And because they have so much stuff, their herdsmen begin to fight. Abram's workers begin to fight with Lot's workers. Because they got all these animals, they got all these people and all this stuff. They become very wealthy. And wealth can lead to trouble sometimes, right? So there was strife between them. And Abram's heart, as the spiritual man, as the mature man in the Lord, he said, look, I don't want strife. I don't need to take care of primarily of myself at the sake of losing you lot. So I just don't want there to be strife. So Abram said that. And then in verse nine, Abram looks at Lot and he says, isn't the whole land before you? So separate yourself from me. And he graciously said to Lot, if you take the left, I'll go to the right. If you take the right, I'll go to the left. Right? That's a pretty gracious statement for a man to make whom God has just promised that entire land to. God didn't promise it to Lot. He promised it to Abram. Amen? Lot was the nephew. Abram was the man that God had called and given the promise to. And Abram was not so pompous 
He didn't feel so powerful and so entitled, amen, that he held himself up over Lot in that way. And I think that is beautiful because Jesus himself, when he came to earth, came to serve and not to be served. And Abram was so Christ-like in what he offered to Lot. And I'm going to have just a tiny bit of overlap from last week because I know we had to hurry at the end. But I referred you to Matthew 5, 5, where Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I said, this verse could be applied to Abram. And hopefully it could be applied to each one of us. We talked about what meek was. And meek does not mean that you think nothing of yourself. Meek does not mean that you walk around like this and you never talk. Okay, some people think that's meek. That's not meek. Okay, meek is somebody who is strong and, and a great defender of God Almighty and his word. Amen? But a meek person is not a person who is apt to defend themselves. All right? They are willing to put themselves on the back burner for the sake of God and his gospel. Hallelujah. But God says, ironically, those type of people who don't grab at everything for themselves but are quick to uplift God and defend him, those people, the Bible says, inherit the earth. And I quoted to you C.S. Lewis. His famous saying is, if you aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in with it. But if you aim only at the earth, you don't get earth or heaven. Love that quote. And I told you that I kind of came up with a corollary to that quote. Uh, another way to look at that would be aim at pleasing God. And you'll get personal joy thrown in. If you aim at pleasing yourself, you won't get either. You won't be able to please yourself and you won't get joy. Hallelujah. I've always said this. Happiness is a byproduct of holiness. Right? You aim at pleasing God and you find out it really does please you as well. Because that's what you were made for. So when the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, God is not kidding around here. And sometimes I think we read the Beatitudes and we take for granted what's being said. Uh, you can't really dance around this one, right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does it mean to inherit the earth? What do you think it means to inherit the earth, right? You know what an inheritance is, and you know what the earth is. Can I get an amen out there? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, in the here and now, that means we will enjoy what God has given to us. But what it means in a broader sense is there's coming a day when Jesus is returning to this world to set up shop, and he's going to rule from Jerusalem. And he's going to rule in the millennium over the earth. And guess who is going to rule with him? Anybody out there? You, you with me on this? You are going to rule with him. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there's coming a day when you won't have to vote for who the president is anymore. How about that? You won't have to vote for president anymore because Jesus is coming back to take over. There's coming a day when literally on this earth, I know it's hard to believe, we won't need a Congress. There won't be any United Nations. We won't need any of that stuff because Jesus alone is going to rule and he is going to rule with his people. Hallelujah. We get the earth. I'm glad to see that clapping. I'm, I'm understanding the, uh, the uh, visuals that I'm getting here, the little actions I'm starting to understand. Okay, so Matthew 13, 40 and 41. Now, wh how, how does this happen? We inherit the earth because... My friends, eventually the wicked are going to be gone. Now, that's a very sad part of this because those who reject Christ eventually will be removed. People often say, Shelly, how can you believe in hell? And I say, how could you not believe in hell? I can't believe in heaven unless I believe in hell because for there to be a new heaven and a new earth full of only righteousness, sinners must be removed from it. Okay? So the Bible says Jesus said when he told the parable of the weeds, and the wheat, he said in Matthew 13, 40 and 41, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. Read this whole parable sometime this week, okay? So Jesus said, 
There's coming a day when I'm going to return. My angels are going to gather every cause of sin and every lawbreaker, every sinner. Watch this. And throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. See what happens there? The lawbreakers are removed. They are banished to hell. And it's not like God banishes them to hell and on purpose makes it a place of torment. When you are put away from God who is good, God is good. All goodness comes from him. When you choose to be removed from him, you will have weeping, regret, and gnashing of teeth because you're removed from all goodness. Okay? But the, the purpose of that is so that the righteous can be in the kingdom of their father, inherit the earth. Hallelujah. Okay, so this is biblical. You hear it in the uh, imprecatory Psalms of the Old Testament, Psalm 104, 35. The psalmist said, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. And then he has the nerve to say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord. And you say, what's going on? This guy seems pretty angry. Well, how many of you, there are times in your spirit, you just say, Lord, I'm, I'm so done with it. Take away the wickedness from this world. Jesus, come back and make it right. You know, well, when we're praying that, we are praying for God to come away and do with wickedness. But I got news for you. Wickedness is contained in people. Sin is contained in humans and acted out by humans. So we need to get down on our knees and pray for people who don't understand that. And churches need to quit beating around the bush and start preaching these passages of scripture. And like the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Can I get an amen out there? Because this is what Jesus said. And people need to know it. Now, you, you got to say it by the power of the Holy Spirit. you got to do it winsomely. That's the kind of thing that I'm attempting to do on TikTok. Making titles that will entice people, speaking from the heart, speaking out of love, but telling the truth. Amen? Some people get angry, and some respond, and that's what we have to look for. So Abram was truly meek in this situation. Therefore, he became the father of a faith. Abram was promised the promised land, right? Because he was that kind of guy, God made him that kind of man of faith, a meek man. In Genesis 13, 10, oh boy, we've already got to a second verse. You marking this down, Larry? I want you to put it in your notebook. Tuesday night, Shelly got to a second verse, okay? And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You might think, well, this isn't very, this isn't an extremely spiritual uh, verse. I don't see what you're going to get out of this one, Shelley, but this one is packed. Because I want you to think about Lot. Where did Lot end up? We all know, right? He ended up in Sodom. Remember, he uh, was rescued by God. Abraham interceded for Lot. Lot was rescued by God, kind of by the skin of his teeth, you might say, right? And then we have Jesus in Luke chapter 17, comparing his return to the days of Noah, when people were suddenly swept away by the flood. And Jesus compares his return to the days of Lot, when the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were suddenly destroyed, right? So we know Lot got himself in a very precarious position. So the question is, how did that all begin? Here it is. Here it is. Here's how it started. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw. Let that sink in for a minute. Lot chose to lift up his physical eyes and to see and ponder that this particular valley and what, what, what did he say about it? The thing that he saw was that it was well watered. It looked like the Garden of Eden, but it also looked like the land of Egypt. So Lot is saying, man, if I could live in a place that was like the Garden of Eden, well watered, lush, beautiful, a real swanky place. You know what I mean? Is that the word I should use? And he's also, he's reminded of his most recent trip to Egypt where there was wealth everywhere. 
Okay? This is how it began. Now let the Holy Spirit let that sink into your heart. Because we're going we're gonna to stay on this for a few minutes here. And we're going to realize that every downfall, every wrong de decision, and every downfall, and every bad consequence that a child of God goes through, you ready for this? Starts originally as a wrong desire. Okay, it begins as a thought, a single thought in the mind. All right, notice that Lot immediately chose to make this decision through the lens of his physical eyes and carnal appetite. Whereas Abram was looking for the city whose architect and builder is God. I won't take you back there again, but you make sure you make a note of Hebrews 11 and 10. That's a great verse to memorize. That's a great one to highlight. That's a great one to put on your refrigerator. Okay? Abram, yes, he had to live in the physical world. I'm not saying he wanted to live in an ugly place. But the main focus of Abram in everything was, I'm heading to heaven. I'm looking for Jesus. Amen? That was his ideal. And we know from his intercession for Lot and, and, and the sacrifices he ended up making uh, and how God used his life to show us a foreshadowing of Jesus, we know that the most important thing to Abram was not only that he get to heaven, amen, but that everyone he knew gets to heaven. That's the kind of man, woman, teenager, and child God is going to bless. You keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and your eternal home. If that is your main goal, I'm telling you something. You won't be making a bunch of bad decisions. Your decisions will go through the right grid. Abram followed God by faith. Look at this. Physical sight unseen. And God rewarded him mightily. I don't know how many times I've said this in times when I've been preaching, but it's the absolute truth, okay? Uh, one of the things people said during the pandemic was they can't believe uh, that, that it seems like I preach as if I'm in front of a thousand people when I'm only looking at a camera. And the technical department beside me going on kind of goofy motions, right? But the reason I can do that is when I would preach in front of hundreds of people, I wasn't looking at the physical scene. I have always prayed, God, when I preach, let me see souls. Only let me see eternal souls. Let me sense what you want me to sense. Let me believe that this is miracle time. That's what I prayed about at the beginning of the session, right? I don't know what's going on, but I trust that every time the word goes forth, God is doing miracles. You got to keep your, your eyes off what you can see. And you got to keep your heart on the unseen. 1 John 2.16, in the King James Version, here is where Lot went wrong. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, the word world there, you know, sometimes uh, the Greek word world means the people. Like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That world means the people of the world. This word world is talking about the culture. The system under which the world works as it is headed up by the prince of the power of the air, Satan. And the culture is coming at you all the time the wrong way. I know I joke about this sometimes, but you know I love to watch the Andy Griffith show. Okay, I like to watch the old time shows. And even when you're on like a decent channel watching like the Andy Griffith show, show the commercials are all worldly about what you need, what you don't have, what you should have, what is good to look at, what is comfortable, what everybody else has. Okay, that's dangerous stuff. Uh, when we talk about the lust of the eyes in this very famous verse, what does that mean? Matthew Henry said the eyes are delighted with treasures, riches, 
and rich possessions are craved by an extravagant eye. This is the lust of covetousness. Okay, so just let that sink in. When we need to have what looks extravagant, when we're covetousness of so many rich possessions, when we give in to what the world says, this is the type of house you should have, this is how it should be decorated, these are the possessions that you should have, this is how you should look, this is what you should dress like. When the, when the world's telling you all that, you gotta ask yourself the question, where is that coming from? Does the word of God say that? Because actually the Bible says that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds and not just take for granted what we are told. Albert Barnes said it this way. Now this is a long quote, but listen to this. It's worth, and I only put quotes up that I think are really worth it. He said, that which is designed merely to gratify the sight. That's what the lust of the eyes is. This would include, of course, costly clothes, jewels, gorgeous furniture, splendid palaces, pleasure grounds, etc. The object is to refer to the frivolous vanities of this world. The thing on which the eye delights to rest where there is no higher object of life. You can just kind of tell that there are some people, what they live for is how they look and how their stuff looks. That's the main focus. You know, we, we, he talks about furniture there, and I just think to myself, you know, you can sit on a couch that's fancy or you can sit on a couch that's not fancy, but the main point is, do you have a couch to sit on? And if you do, you should be thankful. Amen? Right? So watch this. Albert Barnes goes on to say, now the lust of the eyes does not, of course, mean that the eye is never to be gratified. It doesn't mean that you can't have something that looks nice or that we can find as much pleasure in an ugly as in a handsome object. Okay, he's not denying that some things look good and some look bad. Or that it is sinful to find pleasure in beholding objects of real beauty. For the world, as formed by its creator, is full of such things. And God could not but have intended that pleasure should enter the soul through the eye, or that the beauties which he has shed so lavishly over his works should contribute to the happiness of his creatures. And we know that God loves beauty, especially in the springtime. We look at the flowers and the trees, right? We know God loves beauty. So it's not that God never wants us to enjoy what we can see, but the apostle in 1 John here refers to this when it is the great and leading object of life. When it is sought without any connection with religion or reference to the world to come. So the question that behooves every Christian is this. When your eyes see something that you think you must have because of how it looks, or the status, the feeling that it gives you when you look at it with your eyes, the question that behooves us to ask is, is this the Lord's will or not? That's what you have to ask. Is this the Lord's will or not? Am I giving up something that I shouldn't to have this thing? Am I yielding something, keeping something back from God or the work of God in having this? Will what I, you know, sometimes I think of it this way too. Just because you have enough money to buy something doesn't mean that you should buy it. Sometimes it can make other people feel bad for what they don't have. So always we should ask ourselves, what is the Lord's will in this? Lot lifted up his eyes. And I, do, well, maybe we can ask him someday in heaven, but I have a feeling that at the moment Lot wasn't, saying, God, where would you have me to go, right? Because he ended up in Sodom. He lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere. J. Vernon McGee said, probably during all the time Lot spent in that land with Abram. Now look at this. At night, he would push back the flap of his tent and look out and say to Mrs. Lot, isn't that a beautiful spot down there, right? In the morning, he would get up and say, my, it looks so attractive down there. And the technical department's laughing, and you're probably laughing, 
because listen, I think this is probably true. While Lot was traveling with Abram in tents, he probably did peek through the tent. He's, at night, he's looking out. Oh, wow, look at that man down there, right? Kind of like uh, some guys out there, maybe at a, a new car lot, you know what I mean? Be oh, look at that one over there. You know, shiny, glittery. Okay, but what I want you to realize is what J. Vernon McGee is trying to get at is it started with a gaze. It started with a thought, okay? That's where it began. When the day came that Lot could make a decision and go, well, you know the direction he went. He went the direction he'd been looking at. Okay? No man falls suddenly. And every time when I was typing this, when I was practicing it, and as I'm saying it, the Holy Spirit is really me, really breaking me down on this. Somebody needs to hear this. No man falls suddenly. It always takes place over a period of time. You lift the flap of your tent, and then you begin to pitch your tent towards Sodom, and that's the beginning. Lot lifted up his eyes, he saw the plane, and he naturally headed in that direction. That was the biggest mistake he ever made in his life. Can you imagine that? It's not just, the, I mean, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. I mean, it's true in any way. Uh, you, Jesus said to look at a woman wrongfully is to commit adultery. Why did Jesus say that? Because that's where the sin begins. Okay? And for Lot, what happened here was, he was only thinking of the flesh. He was only thinking of what looked good to him. He wasn't asking for God's direction, and he began to think about it. And if you focus on something enough, inevitably that'll be the direction you move. My friends, many people will say to me, how do you, why do you, how do you love to read the Bible so much? How do you, this, listen, because I think, I, I force myself, even when, I, even when I'm not, I force myself to think on God. Go Godward, my friends. Think about God in every situation. You're going to have to discipline yourself to do so. Because by default, we are sinners. By default, we're going to look at the wrong thing. Okay. Here's a verse that is going to bless your socks off. So have two pairs of socks on. Patty and Greg, I hope you have your two pairs on tonight again, right? James 1, 14 and 15 is going to blow one pair of them off. I know you've heard this verse before, but you probably never thought of it this way until we studied law here. Okay, look at this. Each person is tempted when he's lured away and enticed by the devil. That's not what the Bible says. Just as a little sidebar, by the way, for those of you who haven't studied Revelation with me yet, during the thousand-year reign of Christ, what does the Bible say? Where will Satan be during the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth? Where will Satan be? Bound in the bottomless pit. There'll be no Satan roaming the earth during the whole thousand-year reign of Christ. And yet, as the Christians who enter the millennium in their natural bodies begin to have children... Many, many people will be born over that thousand years. Longer lifespans, no crime, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people will be born. And by the end of the millennium, we find that there's another uprising. One last time when God releases Satan from the pit and Satan somehow is able to round up countless numbers of people to rebel against God. One Try one last time. It's immediately put down. But do you know what I believe part of the reason is God allows that millennial time there and for that to happen? is to show us as human beings, you can never say the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. He can hold it there in front of you. But if, if he's holding the fruit in front of you and your heart is saying, I see the fruit, it looks good. I understand what you're doing, Satan. But I desire to please Jesus. Then the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to look away from the fruit. Can I get an amen out there? Devil didn't make you do it. Your mommy didn't make you do it. Your sister didn't make you do it. Your big bad brother, he didn't force you to do it, my friend. It is your own desire. 
Okay, I like that. I like when you guys make the technical department get sweat a little bit, right? She needs to move a little bit. That's good. So each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. There it is. It's exactly what Jay Vernon McGee was trying to say about Lot. Saw it. It's not a sin to see it. But my friends, it is a sin to keep looking. Okay? Then desire, watch this. I love how God just uses such real analogies with us. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So the analogy here is, you have a desire, you keep looking at the desire, and if you give the desire enough time, the desire is going to conceive and you are going to birth sin. Wow. You focus on the thing enough, and it's going to be born. You're going to act on the desire. Can I get an amen? This is how it happens. You see, you desire. You don't turn away and say, I desire Jesus more. You keep looking. You keep fooling around with it. You keep playing with it. And then eventually what happens is sin is born. Now, what's the next step? Sin grows up. Sin takes root in your life. You stay in it. You keep doing it. You keep repeating it. And what does sin lead to? When it's fully grown up, it brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. And for the Christian, uh, we still sin here on earth. And you say, well, we ultimately, we, ultimately, we ultimately don't die. We end up still going to heaven. That's true. But there's a lot of things that can die in your life because of sin. Purposes that God had for you can die because of sin. Relationships can die because of sin. Okay, a lot of things can be destroyed because of sin. So this is a really important verse. He lifted up his eyes. He saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere. James Burton Kaufman. This is a reference to an area around the southern extremity of the Dead Sea, which was fertile and well watered before the disaster of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So map-wise, it should just be, here's Canaan, Mediterranean Sea, right here at the bottom of the Dead Sea. This would be where Sodom was. This would be where Jerusalem was. But as you see here at the bottom of the Dead Sea, this area, of course, coming off the Jordan here, this would all be well-watered and lush before the disaster. So that's the area that we're actually talking about in real geography. Now, here's what's interesting. Lot said, I like this because it's well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. When I first read that before I read any commentary, I thought, that's strange. He wants the land because it reminds him of the garden of Eden, which you would think would be a good thing, but he also likes it because it reminds him of Egypt. Okay? And um, let's go with a few comments here. Henry Morris said first, as a youngster with his father, Haran, in Ur, in the land of Babylonia, Lot had known the luxuries of the Mesopotamian region. Where Abraham and Lot came from was a very lush area, Mesopotamian Valley. More recently, he'd been with Abram along the Nile in the Egypt. And that was also a very lush and beautiful place. Though he no doubt knew something of the wickedness of these cities, just as he had observed the pagan worlds of Sumeria and Babylon and in Egypt, he nevertheless decided that was what he wanted. I want you to think about that. I really hadn't thought about this before, talking about it right now, but that is true. Uh, God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans, the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, down there in Babylon, where eventually the Tower of Babel was built. And this was an area of pagan idolatry. Wealth and riches, but pagan idolatry, right? And Egypt, where Lot had been secondly on the Nile. I mean, we know about Egypt. Wicked place, but wealthy. And so it's very interesting that Lot would have known what these wealthy, lush places tended to be like. And isn't that interesting that even geographically, you know, just thinking about that, it's a proven fact 
that the gospel is more valued and goes out faster and more strongly in areas where people are hurting, poor, and persecuted. How about that? And everybody wants to rant and rave about what's going on in America, but the fact of the matter is we are spoiled brats. I know there are many people in America that are hurting, so don't take that wrongly, but America is a spoiled nation. We've become very lush and very rich and luxurious, and we value entertainment above anything else. And hey, isn't it interesting that places that have a lot of wealth and luxury tend to be places where Pagan idolatry takes place, right? Okay. Perhaps he also, like many believers today who make similar choices, rationalized that he could be a witness for the Lord there while at the same time enjoying the creature comforts they offered. Do you ever rationalize a sin? None of us have ever done that, right? We've never rationalized the wrong decision by saying, well, maybe God can do this even while I'm doing something that I know he doesn't want me to do. Yeah, okay, especially witness, you know. Oh, I'll, I'm going to hang out with that terrible crowd because I might be able to be a light and a witness for them. Yeah, okay, if that's, that's what you're thinking, you know, you need to pray about these things because that is probably the kind of thinking that Lot had. And here's a very wonderful portion of scripture. Psalm chapter 1 in general, general is a great psalm to share with young people, teenagers. They can understand it. For, I'm going to give it three different versions. In the English Standard Version, it reads, Blessed is the man who walks, not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on, the law, and on his law, he meditates day and night. So God says, if you want to know who the blessed person is, it's someone who doesn't take advice from wicked people, unsaved people. It's someone who doesn't, a stand in the way doesn't mean block their way. It means you don't stand the same way that unsaved people stand. You're not doing and putting yourself in the same positions that the unsaved are in. It's going to lead to trouble. And you don't sit in the seat of scoffers. And I thought, what does that mean, sit in the seat? Well, picture, you know, if there's, a, if there's a bus sitting somewhere, an empty bus, and there's nobody in the driver's seat, and you go sit in the driver's seat of the bus, put your hands on the wheel, people might think you're a what? A bus driver. Because you're sitting in the place, you look like the person that is the bus driver. Don't hang around with scoffers, Right? Now, in the New Living Translation, it says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. You say, well, that's, a, that's for when you're a teenager. You know, you're picking your, your, your uh, group to hang out with in school. No, this is for adults, too. I don't know how many of you adults read fiction books you shouldn't be reading because it's not godly, it's not good. You're following the advice of the wicked. You're hanging out where sinners hang when you're reading that kind of material, when you're focusing on that kind of thing. Same thing with television, right? There are lots of ways that we can fall. In the New International Version, it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Yes, there's a time to witness to the unsaved, but as I always tell young people and old people, your best friends should not be unsaved people. Your tightest people, your best friends, those that you pour out your heart to and get advice from, should not be unsaved people, my friends, because you are not gonna get godly advice. You're gonna get worldly advice. Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Right? Birds of a feather flock together. So what was Lot expecting to happen if because of the riches and the beauty of the place that he was going, he was willing to plant himself and his family among pagans? sinners and as the bible tells us very wicked sinners 
He said it was like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. I love what John Philip says here. Listen, Lot had two reasons for choosing Sodom and the well-watered Jordan Valley. A religious reason and a real reason. The Jordan Valley was even as the garden of the Lord. That was his religious reason. Like the land of Egypt, that was his real reason. Lot had enjoyed Egypt. He had not profited at all from the spiritual exercise of Abram as a result of their sojourn in that land. Abram came out of there repenting, you remember? because he had lied about his wife. Abram came out repenting. Abram came out willing to yield part of the land God had given him to his nephew. Abram came out wiser and Lot came out not so wise. He came out wanting the wrong thing. So verse 11, Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus, they separated from each other. There's a couple things to think about when you read this verse. Don't just gloss over it. What did I tell you? Lot saw, and what did Lot do? He saw and he took. He saw and he went. The apple, you know, the fruit was held out to him, and he let his desire take the best of him, and he went. He did what he shouldn't have done. And the other thing that is incredible here is here's Abram, his uncle, the man that he knows God has promised the whole land to, he should have honored his uncle who was taking care of him, right? And his uncle says, you take what you want and I'll take the leftover. And this bothers me because it's the same today. There is no respect for our elders in the world today. There is none. I watch kids, you know, take the best seat, take the, it was like joking about last week, the biggest piece of pie. <laughs> you know, I've done that. But kids should have respect should show deference to their elders, to people who should be honored. And this is a typical situation. So instead of doing that, what Lot should have said was, oh, my gracious uncle, my goodness, no. You choose what you want, and I'll take whatever you're willing to give me after that. And that's not what he did. Lot chose for himself. He took it. Abram offered. He took it, and he ran, right? He took it and he ran. John MacArthur said this, Abram had just shown great deference toward Lot and the proper response would have been for Lot to return it back to his uncle, insisting that Abram choose first, as was his right. Instead, Lot chose for himself, looking out for his own interests and satisfying his own desires. And as we learned last week, I believe it was, in Philippians chapter 2, we are not to look out for our own desires, but also for the good of others. We are to be as Jesus was, who humbled himself. Lot did not do that. This simple statement of Peter Pett, I love, how important it is that we make our choices aright and with much prayer and thought about what matters most. I feel like I want to tell you this, and it's very important. You cannot just glide through life. You cannot just, as a Christian, say, well, I'm saved. I'm just going to kind of do my thing. I'll let happen what happens. Matter of fact, you shouldn't even let that ever happen throughout a day. Now, granted, when you're on, uh, you're honestly resting and having recreation, like a vacation, recreation is what that means and you give yourself some time to just be and not have a schedule and just enjoy and relax, that's different. But on a daily basis, you, should not, you not only need to do this with your job, your career, you need to do this with your personal life. You don't just let days happen. You need to be intentional about what is happening in your life. You need to be intentional about everything. And I'm, I'm talking everything. I'm talking you sit down and have lunch with somebody you should have in your mind, you should be intentional about where you want that conversation to go. It needs to go to God. It needs to go to things eternal. It needs to go to witnesses. You know, you have an opportunity, a celebration, a graduation party, a birthday party, some big event. You need to be intentional about what impact you want to make at that gathering. 
how you want your conversation there to go, uh, what you want to write in the birth. I, I do this every birthday card I write. I'm very thoughtful about where is this person with the Lord? Do they know the Lord? What do I need to say? What do I need to give? So, you know, I'm talking conversations. I'm talking celebrations. I'm talking your free time. Yes, we, we should rest. There's time to have free time. There's time that you can, you know, watch a movie and, and do what you need to do. But you need to think about it. You need to think, what am I going to do with my day? Because before you know it, your day is gone, right? You haven't had your time with the Lord. You haven't been intentional in your conversations. Put your head on the pillow at night and you're like, I don't know what happened here. And my friends, also with your money. Okay, it's very easy to spend money. Inflation is up, right? Gas costs, everything's going up. We need to be intentional and plan out what we do with our finances. And that means God is not the leftover either. God and the ministries that he's called you to invest in, you need to think about that. So we, we have to make our choices with, with prayer and with thoughtfulness about what matters in each and every situation. And if we, if we don't, we should not be surprised that everything will just kind of be chaotic. All right? So 1312... Oh, my goodness. Where did we start, Bria? Where did we start tonight? Nine? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve? Larry, you, if you had a gold star, a sticker, you should be putting it on my forehead right now. This is unbelievable. I hesitate to even begin. I know I only have a few minutes left. Should I really go to four verses? I, I don't know. This is making me uneasy. Okay, but I guess I'll, do, I'll go there. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. And there are the damnable words. He saw it. He acted upon his desire, right? He went, and now we find himself moving his tent as far as Sodom. And just Real quickly, referencing this map again, remember Sodom is at the base of the Dead Sea here, right? He moved his tent that far. Robert Jameson said this, Lot seems, though a good man, to have been too much under the influence of a selfish and covetous spirit. And how many, alas, imperil the good of their souls for the prospect of worldly advantage? I gotta tell you, I see it all the time. I see people, especially parents, who sacrifice great influence with their children because they give everything, all their time, all their affection, all their greatest efforts to their career and moving up a ladder so that they can have more and do more. And the spiritual influence that they have on their children is not there. And sadly, what their kids know is what mom and dad valued most was their job and the money that they made from their job. That's, that's rough. Um, we have to be very careful in every decision that we make that we're keeping the unseen reality of Jesus, heaven, and the salvation of ourselves and others at the forefront. This is critically, critically important in every decision that we make. And we'll end on this phrase, because I want to show you something about this. Lot moved his tent as far as Sodom. So he had a desire. He acted upon it. And then his tent, he didn't just go toward the valley. Where did he go? He went the whole way to Sodom. Interesting. We're in chapter 13, verse 12 of Genesis, and the Bible says Lot moved his tent as far as Sodom. Watch the progression here. No man falls suddenly. In chapter 14, verse 12, we're going to read that he began dwelling in Sodom. He was really living there. And then by chapter 19, verse 1, we read that Lot, quote, was sitting in the gate of Sodom. He had a lot of influence right there in that wicked city. See how this progresses? Move your tent there. 
You start to actually do your stuff and live there. Next thing you know, you're at the gate, you're at the main marketplace in Sodom, you're at the hub, and everything's going downhill. And, and as we, when we get to the, the story, the history of Lot and what happened, and how God had to intervene and what horrible things took place, you'll see this was a real downgrade. Um, Henry Morris said Christians today often follow the same path, hoping to have both the spiritual blessings of a separated walk with God and the carnal advantages of fellowship with the world. Sooner or later, however, one has to decide which it's going to be. You can't have it both ways. Neither God will allow it and the world will not allow it. And if you think Henry Morris is crazy and saying you've got to pick which one it's going to be, I'd show you James 4.4. 4. God said, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you love this world system and all that glitters and shines and but everything that's powerful and it, you know, what the world desires, you make yourself an enemy of God. That's what it says. The Bible says a friend of the world equals an enemy of God. It doesn't say you can be kind of friendly with the world and kind of loving toward God, does it? It says, no, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. And let's just seal this up with 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. Those are some scary words. So if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God, then the Bible says if you love the world, put that somewhere. Display that. Think about that. If you love the world, that means that God's love is not in you. That's scary. My friends, it is one or the other one or the other we're not going to go to verse 13 i'll read it to you hey okay, it's, it's it's a real cliffhanger here the men of sodom were wicked great sinners against the lord so we find our man lot moving his tent as far as sodom and this is what god tells us about sodom but i'm not going to do verse 13 number one because time is almost up and number two because i don't want Susan and Larry and so many others of you. I don't want anybody having a cardiac event because of Bible study. Because I went five verses, okay? Please, don't send me hate mail. We'll slow it down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll slow it down again next week. All right, listen, I want to pray for you because this has been a heavy message. But how many of you out there appreciate what Jesus has shown you tonight? Amen? That, that's good stuff. Good stuff to know for ourselves. Good stuff to share with the people that we love. Don't forget, pray about this, please. Continue to pray that God provides for Hope and Passion Ministries at hopeandpassion.org and at this address. We need you to keep doing what we're doing. There are big costs involved, but God is a big God and he's met every need. So I thank you for all of you that give. You know, I really do. We, then those PayPal's come in. Uh, the monthly partner come in when the checks come in the mail we appreciate we pray over you and we thank god for you lord i thank you for this evening's time in the word i sensed your presence i thank you lord that your word is alive that it goes right where we need it and lord in each one of us myself and every person that has participated tonight wherever those areas are in our life where we need to really trust you where we need to understand that when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. We need to remember, Lord, when the world tempts us, when the desire is set in front of us, we have to make a decision to say, no, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want heaven more than I want sin, more than I want the world. Give us strength, God, I pray, that you've changed somebody's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not forget to join us Sunday. Don't forget to share that event with people as I'm not able to invite as many as usual. Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And we will be back next Tuesday night, 6.30. We love you. God bless you.